Well, good morning. Welcome to the Orchard. My name is Brian Carter. I'm one of the pastors here, and I have a favor to ask. Would you mind uh, sliding as far this way in your row as you possibly could? Just move toward the middle. We have some people who are still looking for seats. We're putting out some chairs in the back, but if we could uh, say there are rows on there are chairs on the outside edges, that'd be great. If you just slide that away in your section, that'd be really helpful this morning. Now turn and say hello to the complete stranger you are now sitting beside. Thanks for doing that. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 34 this morning. So if you have your Bibles or a mobile device you read from, Exodus chapter 34. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, we have some folks who are moving around who will bring you a Bible to use during this time. If you'll just raise your hand, they'll bring one to you. If you do not own a Bible that you can read and understand, we would love for this Bible to be our gift to you. So we want to encourage you to take it home with you at the end of the day if you need it. Raise a hand, they'll bring you a Bible. Use it or keep it according to your need. Exodus chapter 34. We are in a series where we're looking at the names of God, some of the names of God in the Old Testament. And uh, we, are, uh, we have looked at Elohim, which is God of all gods, God above all gods, the one and only God. We looked at Jireh, God the provider. And today, um, a little different uh, name, maybe. Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 1. Then the Lord told Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I will write on them the same words that were on the tablets you smashed. Be ready in the morning to climb up Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one else may come with you. In fact, no one is to appear anywhere on the mountain. Do not even let the flocks or herds graze near the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two, stone, two tablets of stone like the first ones. And early in the morning he climbed Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried with him the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshiped, and he said, O Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please travel with us. Yes, this is a stubborn and rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins. Claim us as your own special possession. The Lord replied, Listen, I am making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in all the earth, are in any nation, and all the people around you will see the power of the Lord, the awesome power I will display for you. But listen carefully to everything I command you today. Then I will go ahead of you, and I will drive out the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful never to make a treaty with these people who live in the land where you are going. If you do, you will follow their evil ways and be trapped. Instead, you must break down their pagan altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their Asherah poles. You must worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous, is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth, and we pray now that as we gather around it, that you would sow it deeply into our lives and that it would take root there and spring up and bear fruit. That it would change the way that we feel. And it would change the way that we think. That it might change the way that we act. That we might be your people in the world. Not because we say we are, but because it's evident by the way that we live our lives and live our lives together. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but um, sometimes you're walking along and you read something, you kind of mentally acknowledge it, and you go, wait, what? 
Uh, several times this has happened to me over the last couple of years, and I snapped a few of them. Uh, here's kind of what I mean by that. You've been walking along, and you see a sign, and you read the sign, and it says, Toilet only for disabled, elderly, pregnant children. I, I, I don't know how many disabled, elderly, pregnant children qualified to use that toilet, but somebody would have benefited by, from the use of a comma. I mean, I, I'm just walking along, with, oh, yeah, and then wait, well, what? Uh, I saw this one on a few uh, cotton chicken candy nuggets. Again, somebody probably should have said, oh, let's think about order because I'm really interested in candy nuggets, but not so much the cotton chicken. <laughs> uh, this is a church sign, uh, not in our town, but I, I know what they mean, but it doesn't sound like that's what they mean, right? Here's a, here's a couple that I snapped uh, uh, in my travels, this is one of my favorites. Somewhere I was, uh, this is a fire starter log that if you burn it in your house, the whole house will smell like KFC. Who wants that? I mean, I love some KFC as much as the next guy, but I don't want my whole house smelling like KFC. This is one that I was walking down the aisle, and I thought, oh, what a cute candle. This is a unicorn surprise candle that when you burn it, it reveals the skeleton. There were two people somewhere who go, you know what, I have this really great idea. Let's put together a unicorn candle so that when you burn it, you see the skeleton. And everybody went, yeah. And they spend a lot of money and time getting that done, and then it ends up in a clearance place. This is one I ran to when I was traveling uh, not too long ago. Uh, fountain drinks is out of order. Sorry for the incontinence. <laughs> those of you who are older will appreciate that, and those of you who are not yet will someday. You're, you're walking along and you read something and you go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And you go, wait, what? I think that's a little bit our approach or our experience of the text today. When uh, we read that God is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, God reveals himself in that way, we, we say, yeah, that makes sense. But near the end of our text, God reveals to us that his very name is jealous, and he is jealous for our relationship. That's, that doesn't seem to fit. Now, Moses is up on the mountain for a second time. He came down the mountain the first time with the commandments in his hands and saw that the people of Israel had fashioned a golden calf for themselves and were worshiping the golden calf, and he was so angry, he threw the tablets of stone down, and they shattered. He gets everything back in order among the people of Israel. And then God says, go back and get a second copy of the command. So Moses goes back up the mountain. And when he goes back up the mountain, God, it says, come and stands with Moses and passes by Moses and announces himself. It says he reveals who he is. I am Yahweh. That's the name we're going to look at next week, Elohim. Jaira, today God, Elkanah, Elkanah, jealous God, and then next week, Yahweh. He announces that I am Yahweh. I am compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And we, we hear those phrases, and we think, that makes sense to us. In fact, that is the most common way that God reveals himself in Scripture, other than the only way he reveals himself more frequently in scripture is to say he is holy. He is other, he is righteous, he is right acting, he is right in every way. He is different than us, he is holy. And the second way he reveals himself behind he is holy is to say, I'm compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We read that list and it makes sense to us. Because those are the things that we think about God. If you're around here very much, you will hear us preach this truth about who God is. Because the world has some kind of crazy ideas about who God is. And to be fair, they get some of those crazy ideas from the people of God. But when we read scripture about a good and compassionate and merciful and forgiving God, that makes sense to us. But then we read this this, I'm a jealous God. My very name is, is jealous. And it doesn't add up. That doesn't, doesn't seem to be our experience. 
So, so Moses goes up the mountain, he comes back, gets the commands, and when he hears this revelation of who God is, and he, and he sees what God has said is, are the commands that they are to follow, he, he looks at God and he falls down in worship because he realizes the difference between who God is and these rebellious and stubborn people who built a calf while he was up on the mountain the last time is this vast gap. And so he turns to God and he says, hey, we're going to need a lot more mercy we're going to lead on a lot more grace than we first thought. So he makes a request of God. He says, could we be in an exclusive relationship? The way he says it is at the end of verse 9. He says, claim us as your own special possession. Can, can we be an exclusive? Can we be your own special possession? Can we, can we be your people? And God says, Yes, you're going to be my people. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And I'm going to display miraculous signs that have never been seen before. I'm going to exhibit awesome and mighty power on your behalf that has never been experienced or seen by people anywhere before. Now consider where in the timeline all of this is happening. Uh, the Israelites had been in Egypt because of the plagues of Egypt, the mighty acts of God on their behalf. The Egyptians let them go out of slavery. They go into the wilderness. They get backed up to the Red Sea, and God parts the Red Sea, and they walk across on dry land, and then the sea collapses over the Egyptian army. So not only are they freed from enslavement, they're, they're freed from pursuit. And God says, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to do mighty and powerful and awesome and miraculous things for you in this exclusive relationship. But here's what I want from you. Obey everything I command you today. Don't make treaties with the people whose land you are going to because if you make treaties with them, you will become like them. You will become evil like them. And then I want you to tear down all the altars to their gods because you are to worship me and me alone. For I am a God whose very name is Jealous. And I am jealous for my relationship with you. This exclusive relationship is, is what God is defining. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be who I am. And what I need from you is to live into that relationship. But when we hear the word jealous or we hear the word jealousy, we have a hard time seeing that description of God in a positive light because we, we don't experience jealousy in a positive way. Sometimes when we hear those positive characteristics of God, we go, oh, yeah, that's the God I experience, and I don't know what it means that God is jealous. There are also people who have the opposite experience. They don't experience the good characteristics of God. They experience the, the jealousy of God, maybe how they describe it, that he's petty and manipulative and controlling and demanding, and that's their experience of God. And sometimes that happens for us, either our not knowing or our, our knowing in a wrong way because we read the Old Testament and we go, well, that's exactly how that God of the Old Testament sounds. Or, more significantly sometimes, when we talk about the word jealousy, our, our personal experience of family relationships or romantic relationships or friend relationships are all, all happen under a pall of, of jealousy where there's manipulation and uh, anger and control and monitoring and anger and all of the things that we think about when we think about worldly jealousy, not just in our, in our understanding, but in our experience, get projected onto God. When we, we hear that God is a jealous God and he's jealous for his relationship with us, we go, well, I know what that's like. It don't have anything to do with that. But remember that God is, above all else, holy. He is other. He is righteous. He is pure. So his jealousy is not like our jealousy, not like human jealousy. What we see when we see that that manipulative, controlling anger, you know, uh, that, that kind of anger is a human, sinful, broken expression of jealousy, and that's not God. If our, if, our only, if our only point of reference for jealousy is worldly jealousy, it is perfectly understandable why this makes no sense of a God who is holy and pure. And so God reveals himself to us by saying, not just is my name jealous. Look back at that last verse again. 
Notice he says it twice. The first time he says, my very name is Jealous. It's a capital J. He's saying, this is my nature. This is who I am. But then he also says, I am a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. And that's his posture. So we have both his nature and his posture is one of jealousy. But if we know that that's to be a good thing and a holy thing about God, it has to be different than what our experience is. And that's what he wants us to know. When he, when he reveals himself as a jealous God, what he's revealing to us is that he demands exclusive devotion. If, if we're going to be a special possession, he, he demands exclusive devotion. Now it's, uh, it's egg bowl week, right? So Ole Miss people are keeping their distance from state people. State people are keep, more so keeping their distance from Ole Miss people because one of us is going to be terribly unhappy on Friday. But if I could say there is one thing that both Ole Miss and state fans agree about in this week is that those people who are state fans who say, well, I cheer for Ole Miss when they're not playing, for sta not playing state, or they're those Ole Miss fans who say, I, I pull for state when they're not playing Ole Miss, those people cannot be trusted. <laughs> they're, they're either lying or they're not devoted. I don't know which one it is. Now, you don't have to say hateful and ugly things about the other, but you don't have to pull for them either, right? I mean, d devotion means a, an unwavering devotion, a, a not, oh, I can also pull for, I can also be in relationship with. Um, my, my wife and I have been married for 32 years, but before we got married, I dated other girls uh, she dated other guys, but 32 years ago, we stood before a gathering of family and friends and said, forsaking all others, we will be faithful to one another as long as we both shall live. The kind of devotion that God is talking about is this forsaking all others. He, he, is, he is righteous. He is jealous in that he wants our exclusive devotion. We are, we are to forsake all others. Now, imagine what it would be like is if, I, if every time something didn't go right in my relationship with my wife, if she was mad at me or we were struggling or she wouldn't do what I wanted her to do, I went back to the back of my closet, and in a place you didn't know, I had a box hidden of old pictures and old letters, and, or maybe I got on Facebook and tried to connect to one of my old uh, relationships. How, how, how good do you think my marriage would be? Div divided devotion. How angry and rightly angry would my wife be if she discovered that box or she discovered my online connection? When, when, when God, we say God is a jealous God, he is rightly jealous because he demands exclusive devotion. Well, the second characteristic of this jealousy of God is that he is angry in righteous and holy ways against anyone and everything that would threaten that devotion. He is angry against anything and anyone who would threaten that devotion. Now, the, the, the word here is used of God only five times in the Old Testament. It's the only, El, El Kanah, uh, the jealous God, the one whose name is jealous, is only used of God five times in, in the entire scriptures, all in the Old Testament, and when it's use of God, it's always connecting idolatry and adultery. Here's what God is saying. You keep getting into bed with the wrong gods. Whew, that's a powerful image, isn't it? He connects idolatry and adultery. And, and in Levitical law, uh, the offended spouse had the right to stone to death the two offending parties who were having an affair. In Levitical law, they had the, the, the offended spouse had the right to stone to death the man and the woman who were in the affair. It was the elimination of the distraction. It was a righteous and holy anger to eliminate anything or anyone who was threatening this unwavering devotion. That's the image that we're given of how God is in relationship with us. And that seems extreme to us, right? It may, maybe, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't, but that seems extreme to us. But considered in light of a different relationship. Let's say you have a son. 
who is a heroin addict. And they have tried to quit, but they can't quit. They're deeply addicted. And as a parent, you are in anguish. You never know where the son is. You never know if they're in harm's way. Or actually, you, you're pretty sure all the time they're in harm's way. You don't know what their physical health is like. You don't know what their, you know, their spiritual, emotional, their relational health is like. They find themselves in physical circumstances, which are terrible and threatening. You, you find them uh, emaciated because they, they don't eat. They don't sleep. You're, you're, as a parent, overwhelmed with grief. You've worn God out with your prayers. You've spent every resource that you have, every dollar, to free that son from that addiction. And then one day, you come home from work, and the dealer, the heroin dealer, is sitting on your front porch. Do you invite him in for dinner? Do you fix him something to drink and sit on the front porch and talk about how great your son is? Or do you do everything in your power to eliminate that guy? Let me just tell you something, brothers and sisters. They had to pull me off. I might not be big enough or strong enough, but I'd die trying. And the way that we feel when we think about that circumstance is the tiniest fraction of how God feels about everything that is threatening our devotion to him. He's angry. There's a righteous anger. It's a jealous anger. It's an anger that comes against everything that is coming against us. And that's why a jealous God, a holy and righteous and jealous God, would pay any price to free his beloved. We're, we're, his, we're his beloved. We are, we are his dearly beloved sons and daughters. He'd pay, he'd pay any price to free us from our distractions, from our divided devotions. Um, th- this, is, this is why Paul writes to Romans in chapter 5, verse 8. God proves his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, God, God the, the, the jealous one, looks at all of our distractions. He looks at all of our divided devotion and, and decides that whatever it costs, whatever I've got to do, whatever is necessary, I'll do it. God knows we keep getting into beds with the wrong gods. And when, when we do that, we are raising up competitors by ourselves, raising up competitors for our affections for God. And God says, if you can't do something about it, if you won't do something about it, I will. And so he sends his son. He'll pay any price, even the price of his dearly beloved son. Because he is a jealous God who is jealous for his relationship with us. And he'll pay the price, whatever the price, to free his beloved from the distractions. Because God is, God is not... God is not jealous because of what our unfaithfulness does to him. God is jealous for, our, for us because of what our unfaithfulness does to us. Let me say that again. God, God is not jealous for us because of what our unfaithfulness does to him. God is jealous for us because of what our unfaithfulness does to us. Over the course of this series, we've been talking about the one and only God, God who provides. And today, God is a jealous God. And sometimes we struggle with this description of God because we only have an earthly point of reference. Sometimes we, we struggle with what it means for God to be a jealous God because we only know what it's like for somebody to be jealous of us. But God is jealous for us. Look at that, look at that list of, of what God, how God acts toward us. He's compassionate and merciful. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He forgives sin, rebellion, and iniquity. He does mighty and powerful deeds. He expresses his power on our behalf. And who's the benefactor of all of those things? God, no, it's a pouring out of himself for our benefit. God's not jealous of us. He is jealous for us because he knows that only 
When we are in relationship with him, will we have life that really is life? Do you want to experience the God who is Elohim? Do you want to experience the God who is Jireh? Do you want to experience the God who is Elkanah? Then, then pray to that God. Pray to that intimate relational God and commit to what he, what he asks us to commit to. If we want to experience this kind of God, the first thing we have to do is we have to obey the commands. He says, this is what it means to be an exclusive relationship. Do what I tell you to do because I'm, I'm not doing it because I'm trying to be controlling. I'm doing it because I want to mark out the path of life for you, and I want you to walk in that path. And not only am I marking it for you, I'm going to be in you that you might walk that way. But we struggle with that sometimes. I struggle with that sometimes. I want to offer you just a simple prayer of Scripture. Paul writes to the Philippians these words. He says, God is at work in you giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't necessarily struggle with the fact that God has given me the power to do what pleases him, but the breakdown is always in my will to do what pleases him. But God, Paul says, gives us, by his spirit living in us, not just the power, but the desire. Maybe just the simple prayers. Lord, would you... Would you give me the desire to do what pleases you? I, I want to, I don't always want to walk in your way. Would you give me the desire to walk in your way? The second thing we have to do is we have to, we have to confess our competitors. Where, where are you, where am I making treaties with the world and therefore becoming like the world? God says to the Israelites, don't make treaty with those people because when you make treaties with them, you're going to become like them. Where, where are we becoming like the world? Where are we like the world because of treaties, compromises that we've made with the world? I just want to encourage you, by the power of God living in you, confess your treaties and cancel them. Break them. And then, Paul, then God says here to the Israelites and to us, um, tear down all the other gods and just worship me. Where, where, where do you keep erecting competitive, competing gods? Where, where, where is your love divided? Where is my love divided? Maybe the prayer this morning is, Lord, would you show me where I keep building up gods that need to be torn down? Would you, by the power of your spirit, tear those down in my life? Do you, do you want to know the power of almighty God in your life? Do you want to know the fullness of the God who is the one and only God, of the God who provides, of the God who is jealous for you and for me in all the right and righteous ways, then, then pray. And by the, power of your Holy, by the power of his Holy Spirit, God will answer that prayer that we might walk in his way, that we might cancel our treaties, that we might worship only him and find life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we hear the word jealous, and at first blush, we confess it makes no sense to us. That seems like a worldly emotion, but your righteous and holy and perfect and pure jealousy is for our good. You, you, you pursue us. You, you stand with us against everything that would come against us against everything that would distract us and divide our affections for you. So, Heavenly Father, we pray that the fullness of your jealousy would do its healing and redeeming work in our lives. That we, we would see with clear eyes all the treaties we've made, all the gods we keep building up, all the places we keep getting into bed with the wrong gods and suffering destruction because of it. And that we would turn to you, the one who is Elkanah, and know the fullness of your jealous love for us and find life. Do that work of revealing in us. Do that work of confronting in us that we might 
know more of you and your way and your life. In the name of Christ, we pray it. Amen.